Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. And this week, in my first podcast of 2024, I'll be talking to Atlantic Magazine writer Michael Powell, whose name you might know from the years he spent writing about education and culture at the New York Times. In early January, Michael wrote a real barn burner of an article for the Atlantic website called The Curious Rise of Settler Colonialism and Turtle Island. And I have to say, this article really got my attention. Being a Canadian, I've become quite familiar with the odd spectacle of progressives embracing indigenous creation myths, such as the idea that the world was created on the back of a giant turtle, or that indigenous people can exhibit a special, ethnically specific kind of gender identity known as two-spiritedness. But I didn't know that this kind of trend had spread to the United States. Nor did I realize that the fashion for endlessly denouncing North American society as an evil manifestation of settler colonialism, which again has become quite fashionable in Justin Trudeau era Canada, had also been picked up south of the border. But Michael's article isn't just about trendy hashtags and slogans. He focuses closely on the unsettling trend by which activists and academics are weaponizing the idea of settler colonialism to delegitimize the state of Israel within the context of the current war in Gaza. A rhetorical process that can include the justification of Hamas terrorism as a legitimate means of quote unquote indigenous resistance against the Jewish state. But before I roll tape from my interview with Michael, two apologies. First, for my voice, which as you'll hear reflects the virus I caught while on vacation over the holidays. I'm better now, but I was still feeling the effects when I was talking to Michael. Second, you will hear me mispronounce the name of the indigenous group that is most closely associated with the idea of Turtle Island, the Lenape people. I realized my mistake only after I'd completed the interview and I didn't get a chance to correct it. My apologies to any Lenape listeners. So this Turtle Island thing, as you know, I'm interviewing you from Canada and I mean, we're just hearing about Turtle Island all the time. I had assumed the origin of it was Canadian Indigenous, but I learned from your article that it's from the Lenape people who, as I understand, they're Indigenous to New York State, right? Their boundaries were not ours, but yes, New York, and then certainly the North, the Northeast. When did Turtle Island become part of the parlance in progressive American circles? Canada has a sort of different tradition with Indigenous issues. I would say that Indigenous issues are closer to the front pages of politics here in Canada than they are in the United States. But when did you start hearing the words Turtle Island? Relatively recently. I mean, I've heard it a couple of times in a more academic context, but really only in the last year or so, I started to see it kind of moving into activist circles, if you will, right? You start to see it on banners, you start to see it on posts on social media and this sort of thing. Obviously, much like Canada, we have Native Americans all across the country. But I mean, the biggest tribe, for instance, is the Navajo. I mean, that's a high desert tribe. So, you know, Turtle Island, except for kind of a rarefied academic part of that, is just not going to have much meaning there. Turtle Island is part of what we would traditionally call a creationist myth. We were talking in traditional religious context. It's a myth about how the world started. The advocacy of creationist understandings of how the world was created from a culture war perspective, I kind of associate it more with a right-wing thing or like a right-wing Christian thing. Has there been any awkward commentary on the fact that progressives have now been asked to sound by this explicitly creationist understanding of the world's origins? Not that I've seen. I mean, I think it is seen in that sense by left and activist circles. It's seen as a potent metaphor. It's taken as like a respectful reference as opposed to a kind of literalist understanding of yes the correct way to talk about this so you don't have to talk about america putting aside the actual reference to turtle island there is this 
subtext in progressive circles in Canada, I think probably for the last five or 10 years, certainly, the idea of Indigenous societies as being Edenic in the Christian sense, like perfect societies without violence or material want. Stewards of the environment, yes. Which eerily kind of often closely tracks whatever it is that upper middle class white people at places like Brandeis and Smith College think of the perfect society. Like, so in Canada, we've suddenly been told that Indigenous societies had no understanding of biological sex. It was all just gender bending Sometimes in Canada, when people talk about biological sex, they'll talk about the myth of the colonial gender binary or something. The understanding being that Indigenous people had this inveterate wisdom that biological sex doesn't really exist. And has that kind of taken hold in the United States at all? If I said the words two-spirit to you, does that have meaning to you as an American? No, but I think I know where you're going with it, but no. that, that and, and I will say five years ago, I did an, a book on the Navajo and I, I lived there for seven months. And whereas it was not a particularly homophobic society, neither was it. I mean, I didn't hear two spirits. <laughs> In Canada, it's now fashionable to say 2S LGBT, where 2S means two spirit. And it's, I think even the, the advocates of it can't really define what it means, but it's sort of like indigenous, anti-colonial kind of gender thing. But I, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to have penetrated U.S. discourse for some reason. No, I don't think it has. I mean, and and and... Native American nations here, they run a gamut in their views of sexuality, right? I mean, there's a fair amount of Mormons and evangelicals. There's also a fair amount of traditional belief in this kind of thing. And so it's it's a, it's a mix, but I would not say that we're at a two-spirit point <laughs> uh, broadly. So let's talk about settler colonialism. And I guess the first thing we should talk about is, notwithstanding your critique, there's more than a small grain of truth to the idea that Europeans came to the Americas and encountered indigenous societies that had been here 11,000 years or something like that. They've been in the Americas and extinguished a lot of those societies, exterminated lots of people. The idea of settler colonialism, it's not just something that people made up, even if they extrapolated the politics of it to maybe an unsettling degree. We should acknowledge it's based on a reality, right? 100%, as I hope I made clear in the article, I mean, as we both know, you as a Canadian and myself as an American, I mean, the history is a, a depressing and sad one. And the move by the settler colonialists was astonishingly successful with very, very grim consequences. By way of specific example, could you talk about the Navajo, for instance? What was the Navajo experience with what would now be called settler colonialism? They're our nation's largest native tribe, between 300 and 500,000 members, about 170,000 of whom live on the reservation, which is the size of West Virginia. So it's an enormous land. And they were initially pushed off entirely. I mean, one of a number of kind of trail of tears. They were marched off by Kit Carson right after the Civil War to a place off in the desert of New Mexico. And in some ways it runs kind of counter to this larger, sadder history in that they were able over time to convince General Sherman, famous Civil War general, to let them return to their land. And then they slowly built out their land. So they now live on about 85% of what was their traditional land. But here's another interesting thing, and, and, and Navajos will talk about this, and this kind of goes to your sense of was there this Edenic period before we arrived, before Europeans arrived. I mean, the Navajo are an Athabascan tribe. They come from in Northwest territories, and they arrived in the Southwest, depending on the, you know, the archaeology on all this is kind of contested, but let's say around the 13th century. And they dispossessed and fought and had wars with the Hopi tribe and the Pueblo tribes of the Southwest, and they took their land. And, and in fact, there are some tensions to this day between, between those tribes. Uh, and this isn't to argue they, they have some unique sin. It's simply no, certain... Euro Europeans were doing exactly the same thing. French and Germans were exterminating each other in Europe at the same time, right? Of course. I mean, this unfortunately is the way of homo sapiens, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we form our tribes and then we, we set to coveting something that the other tribe has and warring over lands and this and that and the other thing. The Athabascan language group is particularly fascinating because, as I understand, if you look at a map of Athabascan languages, you see a big splotch up in Yukon, 
And then you see like another splotch, like three or 4,000 miles away in the southern United States. For reasons that I think anthropologists can't completely explain, right. which, which just shows the genius of human migration, the fact that people could survive in both those environments. But it, it also just highlights the fact that no one is completely indigenous. People do move around. Right. But you highlight in your article someone I hadn't heard of before. And now we're talking about like the extrapolation of the idea of settler colonialism into a kind of cultish political movement. Uh, he's from Australia. Can you tell me about, I had never heard of this person. Yeah, Patrick Wolf. He was a, I hadn't heard of him either before I started looking into this, but he was a anthropologist and historian. Actually never had a one university that he called home. I mean, he kind of moved around himself. He really was the one, one of several, but I mean, you know, kind of intellectual, in his case, fathers of settler colonialism as a theory and one that you could apply as a lens, kind of thinking about power, imperialism and other things. You could extend all over the world. I mean, so that there's there's settler colonial theorists now who look at the Punjab and Kashmir and, but it. Having said that, it clearly has the most resonance. I mean, it's, it's taken on the most resonance in the West, and particularly as applied to his native Australia, which also had a horrible experience with the white settlers coming in, and then the United States. So those were sort of the two, that is Australia and the United States, he saw as the two great settler colonialist states. But what's interesting is it's kind of the combining of the two, right? Settler colonialists kind of implies a extension through time. Well, it's like a bloodstain. Yes, exactly. Right. I mean, clearly, the United States and, and Canada were colonized by Europeans, uh, and they did that often brutally. But this does, as you say, implies a different, it's like, a, it's a, it is a kind of a mark of Cain that extends forward in history. As I mentioned, Canada, this is just kind of closer to the surface of our politics, is that in Canada, infamously, we had something called the, the residential school system, which persisted well into the 20th century, whereby tens upon tens of thousands of Indigenous children, sometimes against their parents' will, were sent to these integrationist, most would call it assimilationist schools, where they were not permitted to speak their ancestral languages. And as a result, we've lost many of these precious tongues. And and I think a lot of people would say, well, that's a complete extension of the colonial project. And so this isn't something that happened in the you know 17th and 18th century. This is something that happened within the lifetime of people who are alive today. It's a great point. We have the same in the United States. I mean, there were residential schools. In fact, the general who founded the schools famously said, or infamously, what is it? Kill the Indian and the child. Yes, save the man, save the man by killing the Indian inside or kill the Indian inside by, and save the man. Then when I was on Navajo, the grandparents would tell me terrible stories of those schools. People listening to the last few minutes will think, wow, these, these two lefties are just full of post-colonial <laughs> guilt. But tell me how you think these, not just well-intentioned, but, but somewhat obvious moral and political truths we're describing have been extrapolated in an unsettling way under the rubric of what people call settler colonialism. As you pointed to, this sense of a of a stain. So, for instance, you will often see both on social media and banners that people are holding up in the demonstrations today around Israel. You'll see, you know, destroy the settler state from Turtle Island, that is North America, to Palestine. It's kind of chilling on both ends. The charitable way of saying that is it's sort of universalist in the sense of Marxism, in the sense of like their struggle is our struggle. Yes, except when you're, when it, when you're taking part in a demonstration that, you know, in the case of the one I saw, flood Brooklyn, you know, you know and the flood is the word taken from the, you know, what Hamas said, it flooded those kibbutz on the other side of the border and, and slaughtered people. Murderous overtones. Yeah. Yes, it requires a certain credulousness not to see that it has a certain ominous overtone. When you press people, no one's talking about sending hang gliders into Minneapolis or New York or something and doing what Hamas did. But it's it's suggesting a illegitimacy that within the context of settler colonialism and Hamas, a bit chilling. You interviewed people who are activists and proponents of this philosophy. And from what I can tell, 
for all their slogans about from Turtle Island to Palestine, in their more candid moments, they recognize there's a difference. So like in the case of Israel and the Palestinians, there is an actual literal sense of you interviewed some people, American academics, if I remember correctly, who are like, no, 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 we're, we're talking about like getting rid of Israel. We're not interested in a two state solution. Israel is a kind of colonial cancer and we have to get rid of it. Whereas in the context of the United States, even in the more aspirational rhetoric of people whom you interviewed, they recognize the United States isn't going to be destroyed and we're all going to go back to Poland and Wales and stuff. There's a difference there, right? That's right. Very decidedly. And that's one of the things that was striking to me. I mean, look, as we both said at the, the outset here, you want to say the United States or Australia or Canada are settler colonial states in their inception and even in their project in many respects going forward, it'd be very difficult to gainsay that. It's a curious thing, however, that in the words of Patrick Wolfe himself and many of those I interviewed, that, that Israel is seen as being the almost perfect distillation of a settler colonial state, they say. And that strikes me as requiring some intellectual yoga. One of the weird things about this philosophy is just how binary it is. There is indigenous people and non-indigenous people. And as you mentioned in the article, like not just Israel, but the Levant, there's 50 different civilizations from like Babylonians to Hittites to Assyrians to Egyptians to Persians to Arabs to Jews who, yeah. who could lay claim to being indigenous. And in a way, they'd all kind of be right because history is messy. And, you know, there's been at least a small Jewish presence there for thousands of years. You make the point that the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built on literally on top of the site of the, the original Jewish temple. But what's weird about this is I actually hear conservative Zionist Jews co-opting or trying to co-opt this settler colonialism argument. And you see them on social media say, no, 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 Jews are the original indigenous people of, of the area. Yes. <laughs> is this really an argument we should be having? Like everybody knows that, yes, of course, Jews have been there for a long time, but like if you want to play that game, like anybody could play that game. Like, is it even a useful game to play in that context? I actually see it like when it comes to, you know, Australia, where you had people who've been there for literally tens of thousands of years, and then suddenly a bunch of criminals from Victorian England show up and start getting sunburned and talking with a funny accent. Yeah, that to me, that is, it's pretty stark. But in the case of the Middle East, is it useful for either side to play that game? No, no. I mean, I joked at one point in, in talking with someone that, you know, they should open meetings, you know, with an, a land acknowledgement of the Jews wherever in Amman. But look, you're absolutely right. They could also open it up with a land acknowledgement of the Assyrian Empire or the Hittites. Samaritans? Don't forget the Samaritans. The Samaritans, right. I mean, it's, I mean, that way lies madness in what was then British Palestine. Hundreds of thousands of Arabs were forced out or left. At the same time, it's actually kind of interesting, the symmetry of the math. There were about 700,000 Arabs who ended up leaving what became Jewish Israel, or predominantly Jewish Israel. There were also about 700,000 Jews who were expelled from, collectively, Iraq, Algeria, Morocco, and ended up in Israel. And, you know, so I don't know, you know, who's who's the indigenous? I, I just think indigenous, I think, in, in that sense, in that area, it's an unfortunate word. There was a line in your article where you say, I think maybe it was when you were interviewing Roger Berkowitz from Bard and from the Hannah Arendt Center, where he was saying this has gone from politics to ethics, which to me, I interpreted it to say that when you say there is settler colonialism going on in this country and and here are here are the settler colonialists and here are their victims it's basically a moral proxy for saying here are the people who are righteous and deserve to stay there and and live depending on context and then here are all these other people who at best just have to pack up and leave there's something very apocalyptic about it early versions of protestantism calvinism predestination where like just people were born with righteous souls and others weren't there's something kind of religious about this, isn't there? You know, there's this battle within the left, certainly in the United States, between the identity side of politics, and then there's those who argue for class-based approach to politics. I buy Roger Berkowitz's take. I mean, I think, you know, a class-based coalition politics, that's a politics. And you're not looking for original righteousness in it. You're looking to make common cause around a series of, of issues. 
It's me, Jonathan K, with a brief station break, so I can remind you that Quillette isn't just a podcast. It's also a website full of fascinating essays, including, freshly published, a great new piece by celebrated Israeli historian Benny Morris on Israel's occupation of Gaza in the mid-1950s and the lessons that can be learned from that time. I'm also going to engage in a shameless act of self-promotion and mention a piece I wrote a few days back on Western Europe's Forgotten Nightmare, that's the title, about Rachel Crastle's wonderful new history of the 1870 Franco-Prussian War. And now, back to the Quillette podcast. Then I should back up, I mean, there's another strange aspect to it. I mean, you have Zionism, starts in the 1880s, and yes, you're starting to get an influx of Jews coming into Palestine, which is then a British mandate. And they're coming in from mainly at that point, as I understand it, you know, Eastern Europe, Russia, where there's pogroms. And there is this, this sense that, you know, maybe someday we can work towards a Jewish state. That's the only way we're going to be safe. The numbers continue to grow. By the 20s, you have, at least as I understand it, you know, over 100,000 Jews. And you have many more Arabs living there. And then, of course, you have the the rise of fascism and many more. And certainly with that latter group, it's awfully hard to argue that you're a proper colonialist if you're fleeing Berlin circa 1933. In fact, I, just if, if you'll just indulge me for a second, I just finished a, a fascinating novel, The Opermans, which was a written by a German Jewish novelist, very popular at the time. And it's kind of an astonishing book. He looks at a family in 1933, and he's writing it in real times, but it reads as if he sees everything, you know, that's coming, right? I mean, it's it's very clear, very chilling. And, and a number of the characters talk about, you know, this is again, written in 1933. I'd like to go to the United States, but I can't, you know, I can't get a visa. They won't let me in. I'm going to Palestine. And they're not going to Palestine because the Germans are, you know, using them as colonialists. They're going there because they correctly divine that they have no life left in Germany. They have no life left in Europe, no safe life left. And so it's just, it's, 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 again, this isn't to argue, try to litigate formation of Israel, but it's just to argue these are complicated things. And I don't see the light shed by settler colonialism. And it's true. Like, I mean, if I were a Jew in 1935 Berlin or something, like I'd rather work for my brother-in-law Shmata business in New Jersey than backbreaking work on some kibbutz in Israel. But that said, there's a really good book written by, a, at least at the time, a Columbia prof named Rashid Khalidi called The Iron Cage, which gives the uh, story of Israel's creation and the Nakba from the, the Palestinian perspective. And he he makes the point that a lot of these Israelis came in, or Israelis as we now call them, the land often was controlled by absentee Turkish Ottoman era landholders. How come like no one mentions that from a colonial perspective, the Ottomans controlled that entire swath of real estate? How come we don't talk about them being big colonialists? Maybe because, you know what, they weren't settlers. The idea was kind of like the Romans. They just kind of took the place over, but they let locals. I think that's right. Yes. Fair. Okay. So we've settled that. The Ottomans are off the hook. But I want to go back to this conversation we had with Roger Berkowitz at Bard because he said something very interesting. He was talking about settler colonialism. You use that to make moral determinations about Israel. It's not explicitly anti-Semitic, but it's it's anti-Semitic adjacent. And I guess the legalistic way you would say is, no, 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 it's, it's not that we don't like Jews. We don't like colonialism. So we don't dislike the Jew in his capacity as being Jewish. We, we dislike him in his capacity as moving from the shtetl to come to Israel, and then he becomes a bad person, because then he's a settler colonialist who has to be, I mean, in some of these conceptions, displaced or worse. You have some chilling examples of people using rhetoric that euphemistically cheered on these, these horrific October 7th terrorist attacks. Right. But nominally speaking, the Jew is under attack for being a colonialist, not for being Jewish. This may seem far afield, but is this why Claudine Gay, the former Harvard president, and Liz McGill at Penn and their equivalent at MIT had such a difficult time answering that question at the House of Representatives, I think it was Education Committee back in December, when they said, like, is it out of bounds to call for the genocide of Jews on campus? 
And my reading of it is you could see these computers processing in the brains of these presidents. It's like, well, if we say yes, it means you can't say from the river to the sea and you can't use all this rhetoric about rolling back settler colonialism. And so maybe a charitable way of considering those infamous performances of those three university presidents in December was they were trying to do the same how many angels can dance in the head of a pin trick of saying, we're not calling for the genocide of Jews in their capacity as Jews. You know, we want to throw them into the sea in their capacity as colonizers. Like, does, does this kind of cultish movement force people to make that kind of legalistic distinction? Because it feels like it does. You know, that's very interesting. I hadn't thought about that. But I mean, I think that it's so out there. Um, I mean, out there in the in the academic culture, or in the waters of the academic. It permeates it. It's like this sort of polite way of, of advocating ethnic cleansing in a way. Right, right. Because I mean, I looked at it and just thought if, if they weren't so obviously and terribly overprepared by their, you know, crisis PR people and their lawyers. I mean, I mean, the obvious thing to say is this rhetoric is abhorrent to me, but we have to balance, you know, free. I mean, you know, you can. By the way, here in Canada, there was a wave of arson against Christian churches. This is back in 2020. And from the prime minister's office on down, there were people who were kind of excusing it because it's like, well, indigenous people are very angry. And that's fascinating. The idea was certain kinds of apocalyptic gestures against white people, settler colonists, whatever, are kind of like morally legitimate, even though they horrify everybody in any other context, because otherwise, where does the logic of settler colonialism go if you're not allowed to use extraordinary means to oppose it? Like it, it, it can kind of lead to some morality bending conclusions. As you know, I mean, there were several academics I spoke to who essentially made exactly that connection. One at University of California, if I, if I remember correctly. Yes, University of California, another Minnesota. Oh, the one at Minnesota, is that the one that's like from Minnesota to Tel Aviv or something? Like there was some slogan yes. involving. Yes, it, it yes. It seems so random to me. <laughs> so let me ask you a question because this article was a very spicy meatball. Uh, did you get any backlash at Atlantic for this? I mean, I, I liked it, but were people angry about this? Not that I heard, though, you know, I used to cover similar things when I was at the New York Times and and I didn't hear there either. The, and sometimes people were upset. But um, no, I, I did not. I mean, I certainly got pushed back outside of the Atlantic. They, of course, argued that I didn't understand settler colonialism and that I was not an academic. That I mean, the pushback essentially, I mean, I think was was that, no, Israel is a settler colonialist state. There is every right for Hamas, essentially. I mean, they tend not to say Hamas, but, you know, for the, the resistance to do what they must when you're faced with a settler colony. And that is, you know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you know, there is a, to use a very antediluvian term, I mean, you know, there's a cowboys and Indians aspect that this seems to bring out in some people like you've stolen our land or you've stolen their land. I mean, because these are often American pro or always American protesters. And we have the right, you know, they have the right to go after them the same way. I don't know, you know, the Lakota Sioux would defend themselves that settler colonialists were coming West. Yeah. So, I mean, it was pretty, pretty straightforward that way. I mean, if I have any kind of regret, there was a couple of people I talked to, I think, fairly pointed out that you could find really some of the other intellectual roots in France Fanon, who, who gets a lot of play these days. There's probably a separate article to be done on that. Wretched of the Earth. Yeah. And, and you know, he had a, a notion that he put forward in several of his works, kind of the cleansing power of violence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that, if you will, kind of rides on a, you know, a horse right next to settler colonialism. Not to turn this into a black turtleneck long fest, but the edition of Wretched of the Earth, at least the version I read, had an introduction by Jean-Paul Sartre. And if I remember correctly, Sartre more or less endorsed that completely violent and nihilistic idea. And I remember reading it and and realizing like this is this is no different from the propaganda you used to see in medieval societies of the, the cleansing power of violence the nation-building power 
of, of violence. Even before World War I, there were people who were talking about how amazing war would be because it would invigorate the spirit of these men who otherwise would just give themselves over to idle fancies and stuff. And it was seen as a real character builder. I mean, this is kind of like the, the progressive version of that. You begin the article with this set piece in Brooklyn where these people are saying all these slogans. This is Brooklyn's your home. That kind of must creep you out. It's disturbing. You know, there was one, there was a chant, we don't want no two state, we want 48. So that essentially means we don't want a political settlement here. They're talking about 1948. But they're saying go back to 19... In other words, go back to the to before the formation. We want to go back before the formation of Israel and have an era, you know, have one nation, Palestine. They didn't mean they want the British to take over, I take it. <laughs> I think I should ask, point of information, right. <laughs> Look, I'm a person of pretty pretty liberal politics. Uh, and I will say that I'm aware that there's a generational difference. I mean, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, you know, which is a heavily secular Jewish neighborhood. And two of my three best friends, their parents were Holocaust survivors. You know, my father, many fathers had fought in World War II. You kind of grew up with a sense of peril, deadly, horrible peril that that people lived in, had lived through, had somehow this cauldron out of which they had come. And full disclosure, I have a good friend of mine who lives in Israel. I mean, he's a very liberal Israeli, and, and his parents had been Holocaust survivors. So the idea, you know, this sort of loose talk of, uh, of violence and, you know, that like kind of any, you know, any resistance is justified. One state, which means basically, I mean, a Hamas state means a hell for many Arabs, much less Jews. There's endless complications, yeah, here, right? I mean, but I'm pretty sure that settler colonialism and kind of some of the eliminationist adjacent rhetoric doesn't really accomplish anything. Atlantic writer Michael Powell is the author of The Curious Rise of Settler Colonialism and Turtle Island, which appeared on the Atlantic Magazine website on January 5th. Thanks so much. Oh, sure. No, this was really interesting. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events.